Welcome to Entrepreneurship Hour 407. Um, just to quickly ask everyone that has the computers on to shut them down, please. Um, we are really um, uh, privileged here to have uh, Jeff Lawson here, who's the co-founder and CEO of Twilio. Some of you know about Twilio. Um, for those who don't, we'll hear more about it. Um, let's just say that um, Jeff is a true entrepreneur, um, began his entrepreneurial journey uh, at um, an early uh, stage. In fact, took some time away from um, his studies here at the University of Michigan to actually start a company, then came back and graduated. And he's going to talk to us about software. And so I'd like all of you to um, join me quickly and uh, welcoming Jeff to the stage. Jeff, great to have you here. Thank you very much. Hey, everybody. How's it going? Um, really excited to be here today because I um, wanted to talk about a few things that I'm, I'm passionate about personally. Um, uh, in particular, the notion of software people and why this is such a great time to be an entrepreneur and to be in software. And by the way, by software, I could also mean hardware too. You'll find out why. Um, but uh, to start off, let me tell you, uh, do you guys know about Twilio? Just so you have a quick background on, on what I'm doing. So uh, I'm working on a company uh, called Twilio. Uh, what we're doing is we are taking the 100-year-old history of telecommunications, right, for uh, more than 100 years, since the first phone call in 1876. Telecommunications has been tied to the hardware, the physical network of communications, right? Copper wires, boxes sitting in closets, fiber optics, like a telephone you'd pick up. That's how uh, telecommunications worked for 150 years. Um, but now there's a new way to do it, right? Because hardware is slow. You know, when the telecommunications network wanted voicemail, what did they do? They spent a decade and then we got voicemail. And then people wanted caller ID, they took a decade rolling out caller ID. And then they took another decade to roll out caller ID blocking, right? And that was the pace of innovation of telecommunications. It was slow because you had to upgrade the whole network every time. But we're software people, right? We think in agile terms, right? We ship all the time. And in 2014, uh, decade, taking decades to innovate doesn't make any sense. And so what Twilio is doing is bringing telecommunications uh, out of its legacy in hardware and the physicality of those networks and slow innovation and bringing it into its future, which is in software and communications running in the cloud. And so that's a little bit about the background of what we're doing, but you know, I, I wanted to give you the background so I could set the stage for the story that I'm about to tell about software people that I think uh, is relevant to where you guys are likely going, uh, many of you at least, as entrepreneurs or as engineers in the things you're going to do. Out of curiosity, how many of you are in some kind of engineering, like software, computer science, even electrical engineering? Uh, it looks like a lot of people. Very cool. So I've titled this, We Are Software People. And, and what's important about this fact is that our time as software people is now. It has never been a better time to be a software person than it is now. And my story begins when uh, I was starting Twilio in 2008 and said, I'm going to build this API communications platform for communications an API for developers to use to harness communications and build whatever they want in software that can now communicate. I got this common reaction from venture capitalists who I would pitch it to, right? investors I was talking to about the idea in the early days. They'd, they'd have a look something like this on their face, and they'd say, wait, 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 hold on. Wait, you're going to build an API, a platform? For software, wait, this doesn't make any sense, right? And they get really agitated about it. They'd be like, why don't you just go make a PBX or make a call center or something like that? And then one day, if you're successful, you can add an API onto it later. That's what everybody does. That's what Facebook did. It seemed to work out for them. Why don't you go do that? That didn't make any sense. That didn't make sense to us. We're like, but we don't think the world just needs another call center or another PBX. What we actually need is infrastructure that software people can use to build great things. And this is because we ourselves were software people and had felt the problem acutely. And I'm going to give you a quick history of my background that led me up to starting the company. I was an undergraduate here at U of M in 1997. And the internet was this brand new shiny thing. And me and some friends wanted to play with it. And so we started this company called Versity.com. And at Versity.com, we had uh, free lecture notes for college kids. That was our goal. It was very simple. We just, we're going to pay college kids to go uh, type up their lecture notes, put it online, and we're going to make it free for college kids. And we ended up raising <coughs> uh, money 
from venture capitalists. We raised an angel round first, we grew it to seven campuses uh, in the Big Ten, and then we raised money from venture capitalists, and we expanded it to 200 campuses uh, nationwide. We had over 10,000 college students working for us at the height of the service in uh, 99 and 2000. We employed 10,000 college students transcribing their lecture notes. And it wasn't sort of crowdsourced, everybody just go do whatever you want and let the best stuff rise to the top. We actually employed and paid everybody, $500 a semester, roughly. And so we had this quality control problem. We said, how do we know these notes are any good? Like, we don't want college students failing their courses because we didn't have any quality controls built in. And as we kept scaling up the company to 10,000 workers, who, by the way, only worked for us for like four months, for a semester, we said, how are we going to do this? We said, software is the only way we can scale this business. As we went from seven campuses to 50 to 100 to 200, software is the only way to do it. So we built this, this intranet. We sort of had all these uh, metrics that we collected about every course, right? And you can see this is actually a screenshot from 1999, so the browser looks really crazy, right? Um, but there's a screenshot for every uh, note taker uh, in our system. We had all these metrics, like you can see up there. Uh, when do they log in? How many uh, notes have they done? What percent of their notes were submitted on time? Uh, what percent were past due, right? So we had these metrics of what does quality mean? You submitted them on time within four hours of the end of the lecture, right? And we had note ratings, like the users could rate the notes and stuff like that. So we said, what is quality? And we said, okay, how are we gonna manage these people if they're submitting bad quality stuff? Well, we have a campus manager on every campus. It was usually a grad student who managed 50 note takers on the campus. And we made this robo-manager tool, we called it. So on the right-hand side, you see here, the software took all these metrics and recommended what a grad student should do to manage their 50 employees. And they could manage these 50 employees in about five minutes a day. We completely automated the task of managing these college students. And you could see it, it would uh, tell you whether you should uh, send them an email, and, like auto-selected the radio button. Tell them you should send them the past due uh, email, number one, which was like, hey, your notes are past due, please submit them, right? Or, you know, and if they had sent number one and they still hadn't done a good job, number two would say, hey, you're still submitting your notes late, please do that, right? And it would take you to the whole progression of things you could possibly do to manage that student, from yelling at them about missing their notes or past due, to sending them a praise email, to putting them on a phone list of people you had to call because they're in trouble, to uh, firing them was actually the last one on that list. And it automatically recommended the right action for every student in the system. It was pretty cool, right? And so we had this whole system with one click, a manager could manage 50 college students. And the amazing thing is as we scaled from seven uh, note takers all the way up to 10,000 note takers in about 12 months, every time we expanded, the quality as rated by our customers got better and better and better. And this was my first experience uh, building software that did anything remotely like this. But it led me to this conclusion that software is how you can scale. Right, the power of software was immense. Let's move on to my next company. The next company was a bricks and mortar retailer called Nine Star. We sold extreme sporting goods, skateboarding, snowboarding, surfing, bricks and mortar retail, right, boring stuff. But we had a lot of cool ideas about how we wanted to run this business, how we wanted to use data coming from our, you know, what things we bought, what things we're selling, how much they were selling for, so we could build a great retail company. We started this company in, uh, you know, 2003. So if you're starting a new retail business in 2003, there's so much opportunity to use the data thrown off by retail operations to build a great retail company. Uh, we're really excited to do this. Then we went and looked at how you run a retail business. You know, you need a point of sale system, you need shipping and receiving, you need ordering software, you have all this stuff. And we went out and looked at what was out there, and what we found were these stupid black boxes. Right? On one side, there were these companies selling enterprise, Java, like millions and millions of dollars, you know, Home Depot system. And the other side, we found these companies selling like $79 per cash register, like Windows 32 software that you could run on your Windows XP box. And we were like, wait a minute, like neither of these are what we're looking for. Like we want something that's extensible. We want to gather all this data about what's selling and then run all sorts of analytics on it and pump data back in and run an e-commerce site on this. Like we wanted this platform that we could use to build a business on and we just weren't finding that. So we ended up building our own from scratch point of sale, shipping and receiving, all this cool stuff. And we got to play with like cash registers, like cash drawers and receipt printers and laser scanners. And it was actually really fun to build that. But we found that in order to have a platform <laughs> that as software people we could innovate on top of, we actually had to go build our own base of a platform for retail. And in my other company, uh, StubHub, 
online ticket sales, right? Secondary tickets for sporting events and, and uh, concerts and stuff like that. So at StubHub, we had this problem. We said, if we're going to do commerce right up until the event, if we're going to let you buy a ticket to the football game an hour before the event, and we're going to have a courier deliver you that ticket, we need communications. We need to communicate to the seller. Hey, seller, your ticket just sold. We're sending a courier to pick it up from you. Then we needed to call down a list of couriers. Hey, courier, we've got a job for you. Then we have to call the, the buyer. Hey, buyer, a courier is showing up in two minutes. Make sure you're ready. And again, when we went and looked at how we would go do this, what did we find? We found an industry, telecommunications, trying to sell us these black boxes. They're not configurable. They're prepackaged solutions. You plug them in. You know, a forklift brings it in. You plug it in, and they're completely inflexible. It's whatever the vendor wanted to sell you. And we're like, this is not what we have in mind, right? I don't want to go spend millions of dollars, spend 24 months getting a vendor to install this big thing, only to have it be you know, uh, uh, completely unconfigurable. We can't build on top of it. We're just stuck with what the vendor sells us. And that's why we started Twilio, actually. It was based on you know, this experience. So like this notion that keeps coming up in my career, which is, as software people, what we need are platforms to build on, and we need to iterate quickly, and that's how we're going to win in our businesses. And so I wanted to talk about this. And, and one of the things that, that spawned the thought for me about software people was something that, uh, the one other thing that I did in my career, uh, I was in product management at Amazon Web Services in the early days of AWS. And a really interesting thing happened at one of the Amazon.com company-wide all-hands meetings uh, that we had. So Jeff Bezos would take a stage like this, and there was a theater with like 5,000 seats where all the employees would pile in, and he'd take Q&A. And one of these Q&As was really interesting. Somebody asked a question. I don't even remember what the question was. It was something like, you know, hey, is Amazon going to open bricks and mortar retail stores? Something like that. I don't even remember what it was. His answer, though, is what I remembered. He said, you know what, in case it's not clear to everybody in the audience, in this company, Amazon.com is not a retailer. He said, Amazon.com is a software company. It's just we don't sell operating systems like the people in Redmond. We sell a package that's going to show up at your door with something you wanted. But just as much as Microsoft or Oracle or any one of these other companies, we're a software company. Just the output of our software is different than the other guys. That always stuck with me. That is a fascinating concept, right? Here's a software company that happens to ship packages as opposed to a software company that ships operating systems. So it leads me to this question, right? Who are software people? Like there's something going on here, this sort of worldview. Who are software people? And that's the question you know, I asked today. And, and here's a quick hint for you. Being a developer, like merely writing code, does not necessarily make you a software person and vice versa, right? I see software people as anybody who sees the world through the lens of software. It's a mindset, not a skill set. And it's not just developers. In fact, it can be anybody in any kind of company holding a variety of titles who can have this mindset, who can have this worldview. It's really anybody who sees a problem in the world and says, great. How can software solve this problem? It's the first thing that pops into your mind when you see a problem. How can software solve this problem? Because software people fundamentally believe that any problem can be solved once it's in the domain of software. And so our job is to pull the world's problems into the domain of software. There's an interesting thing Jeff Bezos said in that all hands. He said, in case you didn't know it, we're a software company. We're going to win because we're going to arrange magnetic par uh, particles on hard drives better than our competition. I always love that. Like, that's the work output of this company is arrange, you know, the best arrangement of magnetic particles on hard drives. And so if you think about software people in that context, right? software people are those who solve the world's problems with magnetic particles. Let's put SSDs aside for a minute. So the good news here, can you guys see it? I know the screen's a little funny. Uh, the good news here is that now, 2014, is the best time ever to be a software person. I firmly believe that for primarily two reasons. Number one, more and more of the world's problems are solvable by software people. And number two, less and less of the world's non-software problems hinder our progress as software people. 
So let me talk about these for a second. So first of all, more and more of the world's problems are addressable by software people. This is the biggest one. If you think about software and computers and computing in general as a subtraction, right? You get take in some part of the world, right? Input something, sense something in the real world, do some computation, and spit something back out into the real world. Right? If computers didn't take in the real world and then spit something back out into the real world, they wouldn't be useful to us. Right? They'd be a box and we would have no idea what's going on inside. So this is the fundamental model of computation, right? And so if you think about what we've been able to bring in and spit out of computers has evolved quite a bit over the last 50 years, right? What started as you know, punch cards and teletypes, very primitive, and then we got better. We had keyboards and laser printers, you know, is it the way to get <coughs> text in and out. And then we got more fancy. We got audio cards and video cards. We could digitize multimedia and get it into computers and pull it out of computers. We keep getting better and better at digitizing the world. In fact, you can really look at the history of computation as what started as solving numerical problems with the early computers in the 50s and 60s, the first two decades of computers were used to solve numeric problems, right? Missile trajectories, census calculations, things like that. Then the next two decades, we got better, right? We solved textual problems because we introduced the keyboard and the printer, and now suddenly the computer was on every desk in every office, right? Because we could do word processing and spreadsheets and things like that. And then the next two decades, the 90s and 2000s, we were able to solve those multimedia problems. Right, get audio and video into and out of computers, and now you get MP3s, and you get YouTube, and you get all that stuff. And Jurassic Park, all sorts of fun stuff. But now we're in the next <coughs> phase of computing. And I call it the everything else phase. Why? Because we are able to sense and actuate more and more of the world, right? So if you think about this abstraction software, there's sensors that take information in, and actuators that spit something back out in the real world. What's going on right now is this amazing proliferation of sensors and actuators in the world that are letting us sense more and more of the physical world and actuate back out in the physical world. Why? Primarily one reason. Smartphones, right? These things are just buckets of sensors and actuators. You can look at the number of things, the number of interactions that we now have in all of our pockets connected to the supercomputers in the cloud, right? How much of the world we can now sense that just five years ago we didn't have visibility into? You know, similarly, you can look at Twilio as this means of sensing and actuating, right? You can programmatically control 15 billion mobile phone devices and landline phone devices around the world. Control their speakers, their microphones, the ringer, the vibrator, like all this stuff, right? And now you start to say, okay, what can we do with it now that we can program this stuff, now that we can sense and actuate more and more stuff in the real world? Well, let's look at an example. Square. How many of you guys have a square? Right? It's a neat little device. The key thing to note about this device is it's a tiny little sensor, right? It senses the magnetic strip on a credit card. And then what does it do? It takes that information, it senses it, it sends it up to the cloud where there's some computation, right? Charging that credit card and then it actuates back out in the form of an SMS receipt. That's pretty cool, right? Let's look at another example. Uber, how many of you guys have ridden an Uber? I know it's just, just starting to hit Detroit, right? So what this, you know, the pattern here <laughs> is that the mobile app is able to sense the location of all the drivers and all the people who need rides, right? And then software in the cloud matches those people up in the best way. Let's look at another example. Fitbit. How many of you guys have a Fitbit? A lot of people think of Fitbit as a hardware company. But it's not. If you just had that Fitbit, it would be useless to you. Right? The product you're actually buying is the software running in the cloud. The Fitbit is just the bridge needed between the existing physical world and the world of software. But the product you're buying is the result of the software, not actually the hardware itself. So there's an interesting pattern you start to see. There's this sort of minimalism to companies who are digitizing more and more of the world and moving it into software. Minimalism in the hardware. Why? Because software is where all the flexibility lives. So you build the minimum amount needed to bridge the physical world into a computer, 
and then everything else is software. Let's take a look at a few examples, right? If you are not a software person, this is your cable remote. This is the cable remote you design. And you advertise, it's got 104 magnificent keys on it. But guess what? This remote won't do anything that it wasn't designed to do on the day it was manufactured in some factory. Right? Here's what software people do. That's the remote a software person designs. Why? Because it's got the bare minimum number of buttons that you need to be able to control the software. Because everything you bake into hardware, you can't change later. But software you can, and Apple TV ships updates all the time. New features, new functionality, new channels, fix bugs, respond to the competition, right? That's pretty cool. That's the pace at which software people operate. And the hardware is there just to support the advancement of the software people. Let's look at another example, payments, right? Not software people give you that device. How many of you guys have seen that sitting on the counter at some you know, corner store, right? So what happens when I'm a merchant and I got that thing sitting on my counter and I want to uh, take a new form of payment? Well, I throw that thing away and I buy a new one. Or better yet, I put another one next to this one. How many of you guys have seen that? There's like multiple of them sitting all next to each other on the counter there. Right? That's because everything that this box will ever do was embedded in it at the time it was manufactured. You can't teach it new tricks. But software people think differently. Right? Software people have that minimal dongle, and then Square is fully software. That minimal amount needed to sense the world. And that software is what's key, because the software can be updated all the time. Add new features, new functionality. Iterate quickly, listen to your customers, fix bugs, beat your competition. That's the power software gives you. Let's look at another example. Thermostats, I can never figure out how these damn things work. I seriously cannot, I have a deficiency, I have no idea how they work. Nest, all that thing is, is a screen and a dial. And some humidity and temperature sensors. Everything else, software running in the cloud. Right, automatically figures out the right temperature. Same pattern. Let's look at another example. How many of you guys are, are unlucky enough to have a car on campus? Right? So when you and I want a new car, because we're like, oh, there's something my car doesn't do that I want, I wish my car did. We go out and we buy a new car. Like we sell our old car and we buy a new one. Like that's how it works. That, however, is not true if you own a Tesla. A Tesla is just a touchscreen and software with wheels on it. So friends of mine who own Teslas say, that they get software updates all the time. They get in their car on Monday morning, and the car says, hello, I got a software update last night. Here are all my new features. It's like you got a new car. Because it's software. Because they got rid of everything in that dashboard that wasn't absolutely necessary. It's a steering wheel and a pedal, and everything else is software. right? And they can change that touchscreen however often they want. It's pretty amazing. Let's look at another example. So on the day the iPhone launched, this was the most popular phone in the world. The Nokia 70 something something something, right? You see all those buttons and that crappy little screen. And along comes the iPhone and Steve Jobs says, hey, we got rid of all the buttons. And everyone was like, what? Like, we wanted our buttons. No, no, no. The buttons get in the way because the buttons are baked into hardware. They're inflexible. We can't change them later. But we're gonna move that keyboard into software. Now we can change it all the time. We can add new languages. We can add emoji. We can get rid of the keyboard when it's not needed. Best feature of all, right? That's the power of software, getting rid of everything that's non-essential in the hardware and making it software and the flexibility that it brings you. Let's look at another example in the world of uh, you know, business phone systems. It's kind of Twilio's world, right? This is currently the number one like top of the line desk phone sold by Cisco. Now, you might say, Cisco employs 20,000 software developers. Jeff, how dare you say that Cisco is not a software company? Like, they employ 20,000 software engineers around the world. But um, I'm going to do a brief Jeff Foxworthy impersonation. You might not be software people when 
This is how you scale it out. <laughs> and I shit you not, this is not a Photoshop. This is a product photo from their website. <laughs> That's how they recommend you scale out that Cisco phone. Right? We know that's not software, right? To a software person, you know that the minimal implementation of a telephone is this, a speaker and a microphone. That's the bare minimum that's needed to bridge the world of audio communications from, the, from software into the physical world. Everything else you should eliminate and move into software. That gives you the maximum flexibility. Right, so this interesting thing, minimal hardware implementation preserves the power of software. And you start to see this business model time and time and time again, all these cool companies we see launching, they're running the same playbook, and it's an awesome playbook. All right, so that's what I mean by more and more of the world's problems are addressable by software people. Right, we're sucking more of the world's problems into the world of software. The other thing I mentioned is that less and less of the non-software problems of the world are hindering our progress as software people. Right? And this one, I bet you guys sort of acutely feel as entrepreneurs and people who have been building things and building projects, right? Let's look at an example. Here's this guy. He just built the data center. He feels pretty good about himself. He's like, yeah, check out my, my data center. Like, it's pretty cool, right? Look at the problems he had to solve in order to build that data center. Right? He had to figure out server hardware, networking. He had to buy racks, HVAC, power, real estate. He actually had to decide where he thought the real estate market was going so that he could put his data center in a place where he could expand in the future. Right? This is definitely not software. When you have to solve real estate problems in order to get a server running, that is distinctly not software. Now let's look at what software people have. Right? EC2. You run a command, you got a server. Right? You don't have to solve any hardware problems, you don't have to think about HVAC, all you have is a pure software implementation of where do I run my code. So that is another non-software problem that is out of our way. We don't have to worry about all those other problems. We can get straight to the point of building software. Right? Selfishly, we can look at Twilio the same way. It used to be that if you needed to communicate, you had to go buy all these boxes and license hardware and software, professional services, negotiate with car uh, carriers. You know, you had lawyers involved. Remember lawyers involved, it's no longer software. Right? That's the not software people way, and, and the Twilio way is one line of code, you make the phone ring, and you do whatever you need to do. You get rid of all of those non-software problems, and you get straight to the point of what you're trying to accomplish, right? So it's a pretty interesting thing. But now you would ask, okay, I get it, right? We're computing on more of the world, all these other problems are getting out of our way. What's the point? And this is the most important part of all. It is extraordinarily important that we harness the power of software because user expectations have changed in the world. So you guys are all out there. You're going to go build a company. You're going to go build a product. Your goal is going to be to delight users. But it is getting harder and harder and harder to delight users because their expectations are growing bigger every day. Because of products they interact with, like Gmail, like Facebook, like their iDevices, that are amazing, magical experiences. Right? Google never asks you to delete your Gmail because their disks are filling up. Facebook is never down for routine maintenance, right? These things just work, they're easy to use, and that's the expectation people have of everything that they use. So no matter what your product is, one of my favorite quotes is from uh, a guy at Forrester Research, his name is Harley Manning, he wrote this book on customer experience. And he said, the only source of competitive advantage is the one that can survive a technology-fueled disruption an obsession with customer experience. Think about that. At the end of the day, when any technology can be copied, when any technology can be ripped off and rewritten, what do you have as a company? How are you going to win? You're going to create a great customer experience. Right? So what this teaches us is that in order to win, you have to focus on your user. Make a great experience, because that's the only thing that is going to survive. Anybody can copy your technology, they cannot copy the love that your users have for your product. So if you don't focus on the user, you're in risk. And this is a neat idea for software people, because we move fast, right? We iterate quickly, listening to our customers. We ship constantly. 
because software gives us that ability. And we get feedback from customers quickly and incorporate that into our next designs. Right? How many of you are students of Lean as it relates to startups and product development? Right? This is what Lean teaches us, that startups can move quickly, that any product can move quickly. If you listen to your customers, iterate fast, and constantly ship. This is pretty important because competition is closer in no, no matter what market you end up going into. Competition is closer than ever before. Starting a business in 2014, it's incredibly fierce. Right? It wasn't like this 10, 20 years ago. Why? Because your competition is just a click away. Right? You don't like what you see on the first page of, you know, you click through to some product and you don't like what you see, click the back button. Your competition is just the next, next, uh, next link down. The competition's literally like an inch away from you on a search result page, right? It's incredibly easy for customers to pick what they want. So focusing on the customer experience is critical. I like to summarize this, that in 2014, as a company, you do not get brownie points for using servers. You only get brownie points for serving users. And that's the essence of why all this other stuff melting away is important. It lets you focus on iterating quickly and serving your users. Because I believe we're entering a world that is not unlike natural selection, right? Companies that are able to adapt more quickly to the changing nature of their market and changing user expectations are those who are going to survive. Adaptation to a changing market very quickly is going to pick the companies that win. And if you think about it, if software people and software companies are able to adapt the quickest, because we have Agile and we can ship all the time and listen to users, it means that every industry will eventually become a software industry. Because we will meet the user expectations faster than the incumbents in every single industry. That's why I believe in software people. I believe software people who think this way, who see the world through this lens, and act to fulfill on the promise of software are going to win. I believe software people are the army of ones and zeros. We are rebuilding the world through that lens of software. And in every single market, we are software people and we are going to win those markets against our slower moving incumbents. Uh, that's why I think the software is incredibly powerful. And that's why I'm really excited for the world that you guys are thinking about as entrepreneurs, as you're entering a world of, of amazing disruptive potential. Uh, and now it's your job to go figure out how to do that. So with that, thank you very much. Um, I'd love to take any questions that you guys have about Twilio, about software people, about any of my experiences. Let me drill down on one of the things you talked about. So we're software people, but at the end of the day, we, we do need some hardware, right? Yeah. I mean, we can't drive a car in the cloud. We need, we need actual wheels that hit You saw the Jetsons. Friction. Right, yeah, well, the Jetsons, sure. So maybe we're moving that direction. But, so, so, um, so how, do you, how do you see um, sort of the adaptation, the quick adaptation of traditionally hardware companies and the role that software plays there? I think traditional hardware companies will have an extraordinarily hard time making the transition. It's actually much easier for a software company to come in and create the bridge between the physical world and the world of software that they need to succeed than it is for a hardware company to fundamentally change their thought process and become a software thinking organization. Um, so think about it. I'm, I'm from Detroit, you know, <laughs> go Detroit. Tesla is the best car ever made, bar none. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I could, right? I, there's something, I could hear Detroit shivering right now. I mean, and it should be, right? Like, cause yeah. I don't know, I, mean, I don't know how many of you have cars or you, know, you bring your friends' cars and like, yeah, they have software people at like other car makers, but the rate, like I've, I have a rental, um, I don't remember what it is. It's got like a touch screen interface. It like thinks it's a Tesla, but it's horrible, right? It's unusable. Like at home, I've got navigation in my car and in order to enter a destination, it's like a hundred clicks of a wheel, right? right? It's unusable, I never, like you can't use it. Like, because you just pull out your phone and you're like, you've got, you've got Siri to say like, yeah, I'm going to the corner store, right? Yeah. It's, it's the fundamental difference between people who think hardware and they're like, oh no, we need to have some software, let's hire some software people, um, you know, some developers who just don't think in the same way. So do, do you predict, just to take that example to a more extreme level, that there'll be a software company that figures out how to take on the airline companies? 
right? Because airline companies fundamentally hardware. I mean, you need an. Uh, the airlines themselves or the uh, airplane manufacturers, I wonder? I don't know. Uh, I don't know either. <laughs> um, but if anyone, if anyone does, like, you might actually look at Elon Musk, right? He did spaceships, right? SpaceX. Those things are software with, like, rockets on them instead of wheels, right? <laughs> But seriously, that's no, how he's seriously. built the company. It's the same model over and over again, right? And, and, and we're seeing this. You know, we, were, we talked last, last week about um, uh, Tango Me and WhatsApp and, and the big valuations of some of these software companies relative to their hardware counterparts. And this is, this is uh, the, the market is valuing these more, right? And well, if you think about it, it's, it's, it's obvious that these user experiences are what are going to drive future adoption, right? It's obvious that the carriers are not going to introduce the product that we all want to run and use next. Right, it's going to be software-minded people. It's going to be someone like a WhatsApp or a Tango who's going to invent the next thing we're all going to run and want to use. Right, it's not the carriers, or it's Apple. But Apple, despite the fact that they make great hardware, they're a software company. Right, every one of the products that we buy in droves, iPhones, Macs, whatever, we're buying it because of the software and what the software enables. We're not buying it because of the hardware. Right, Apple creates these uh, beautiful vessels for delivering software. So design becomes more important in the software world. Um, the vessel that maybe sells. that's probably a little tangential uh, <laughs> to it, but um, it's you know at the end of the day, <laughs> Apple is a software company, not a hardware company. Right. Okay, guys, we got the mics. Yeah, um, my question is um, basically putting aside the fact that you were comparing hardware to software. If you compare software to software, my I was thinking like when you guys were talking about WhatsApp right now, like. WhatsApp is an established software company right now, and everybody like knows what WhatsApp is. But there are a lot of interfaces, like there are a lot of other applications that serve the same purpose, but they came in later, so they couldn't grab the market, or nobody knows about them. Like uh, a few days ago, one of my friends mentioned like there's an app called Kick or something like that, and I've never heard of it. Like I've, I, I don't use it. So like, how would you say that you know uh, app like apps like that or like softwares like that to come in later and try and grab the market from somebody else who's already established. Is the question more <laughs> for you, if you were to start a company, how would you compete against someone who is like WhatsApp? Well, I mean, it's interesting, right? In the world of software, it all comes down to user experience and, and uh, exceeding your customer expectations. And I don't think it ends with WhatsApp, right? The bar just keeps getting raised of what, you know, think about it. Um, many of the solutions that are out there today, WhatsApp, Tango, et cetera, they've taken something that used to cost money and made it free, right? Think about WhatsApp, right? Instead of paying for SMS, it's free, or close to it, a dollar a year or whatever. But have they fundamentally made messaging better? Right, is, is it fundamentally better? Is iMessage, is any of these things fundamentally better than what we used to have, or is it just cheaper? Right, in, in a few minor ways it's better. But basically, it's cheaper. So I actually think the next wave of opportunity here is for people to go in and make it better than the legacy, not just cheaper. But um, you know, who wins and who loses in these? Uh, it's minute differences in the product design and timing and luck that are the entire difference between who wins and who loses in these sort of like network effect uh, products. You either hit the tipping point or you don't. Right, so WhatsApp hit the tipping point, Kick did not, although they claim they did. All right, who else? I got one right here. Um, do you perceive a shortage? I appreciate your inclusive message that I can be a software person even though I don't, I'm not a developer or a coder. Do you perceive there is an actual shortage of people with those skill sets as everything becomes more software driven? <coughs> and if, if there is that shortage, how do we alleviate it? Uh, shortage of the mindset or the, uh, the, the skills, software development? The skill set, yeah. I, I like that I can be a software person even though I don't code, but um, you talk about being agile and rolling out products more quickly, and um, at, at some level that takes people who can actually do the, that work, that specific work of yeah. coding and developing. Well, there's a lot of, you know, there is development, and, and look, I think that the world always does need more software engineers. Absolutely, like we have 50 open recs for software engineers at Twilio. Right? So we have a lot of software engineers that we need. I think that there is enough opportunity. As you can see, you know, I just said that every single industry in the world is going to become a software industry. Right? That means we need a lot of great software engineers to make that happen. But I believe that will happen in the fullness of time. 
Um, but then the other question is, is it necessarily, like, do you need <coughs> to be a software developer in order to participate in this future? The answer is no, because you can play a variety of roles, but just ask the right questions. Um, but ultimately, there's other tools you can use, right? There's people who use if this, then that to programmatically create interesting workflows. Uh, you know, some of the most uh, software-minded people I know are great jockeys in Excel, right? Excel is basically programming, right? And so, you know, there's a lot of ways to go about solving those problems that aren't just writing code. And I also know that there's a whole lot of people who, while may not be, um, you know, may not get a computer science degree, um, learn to code at some point in their life and make a huge dent. And I know some great developers who did not get computer science degrees, right? People just learn to code. In fact, every single employee of Twilio, we have 300 employees. Every single one of them has to learn how to code if they don't yet already know and build an app on Twilio. It's part of the rite of passage of joining the company. So it's part of, what, part of our fundamental belief that everybody is capable of learning at least some amount of coding so that you can build a simple Twilio application. Like, that's possible. Okay. One, one question right. up here. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to ask, as an aspiring software person, um, what's your best advice for somebody that's currently in college and then somebody who's, who's graduating into this world? W what do you advise, um, you know, both as, a, as, a, as an undergrad and then as, as you enter into this crazy, hectic world? What's your uh, degree in? Computer science engineering. Gotcha. Uh, make sure to take EECS 370. That's critical. I'm, I'm in there right now. I got a C in that class. <laughs> the worst grade I got in college. Um, it has nothing to do with <laughs> um, anything. Um, what would I say the best advice is? Build real software. How many, how many projects do you have on GitHub? Four or five. Like build real stuff. Because uh, the stuff you do in school is good for learning the fundamentals. Uh, but obviously, like, you don't get in the industry and like, write linked lists all day. Um, and you know, it's not to say you shouldn't understand those fundamentals, but the best thing you can do is just get out both for your software development skills, but also for your experimentation. And do it. we have a, one of our core values at Twilio is draw the owl. It's based on the internet meme. Have you guys seen it? It says how to draw an owl. Step one, draw some circles. Step two, draw the rest of the fucking owl. <laughs> right? Like that's one of the most important skills as either an entrepreneur or at going and working in industry and having an impact however you want to have an impact is just diving in and getting it done, figuring it out. My first programming job, the first time I ever got paid for programming was my summer after freshman year. I had never written a line of code before I came to Michigan. I took one programming course my freshman year. It was like intro to whatever. And um, I was like, this is pretty cool. And a friend of mine's dad ran this weird company. They like made software that controlled like these massive multi-million dollar printers that are like in the basements of every large, large corporation that do like, you know, can like Xerox like billions of pages a day or something. And it was like so esoteric. But my friend's dad ran this company and it was just the, you know, his clients said, we need a web interface to these things for some reason, I don't understand. And I got a news to him because my friend said, oh, Jeff's taking computer science classes. And the guy came to me and said, can you write a web interface to this like Xerox 42 R whatever printer uh, this summer? And it needs to have all these features, right? And I needed to write it in web languages, JavaScript on the server. It was like making its whole resurgence now. Uh, this was 1996 with Netscape Enterprise Server, and it needed to use SQL databases and all this stuff. I'd never heard of any of this stuff. I told him, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> right? And I just went out like, and then, like that day, I went out and I just bought a book. I bought a book about Netscape Enterprise Server. I bought a book about SQL. And he promised me if I wrote really good code, he'd give me beer, too. Um, and, um, you know, and that was just how I did it. Like, I just went and figured it out. And I, like, regularly in the early days, like, I'd have clients, like, we used to build websites for people, and we would just always tell them, like, oh, yeah, we know how to do that. Like, we had no idea whatsoever. But that's how you learn. You just force yourself to figure it out. And so that's, like, the biggest thing I would advise you to do. And that's why, like, GitHub, side projects, just building something for the fun or the joy of it. Go create a 2048 clone. There aren't enough of those yet, right? Just do something that's interesting that you find um, that you find intriguing, that will get you working on something in the real world, and that is then something you can a show off to employers, but more importantly, it just gets you gets you off your butt and building something, because that's the most interesting part of the development of like the software skills. Cool, thank you. All right, University of Michigan, it's a software world. 
and your software people. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you, guys.